Hello there. Welcome to Section 5.3, STAT students. We are moving through our probability distributions, so hopefully you've got a good feeling for what they look like and how to calculate. Um, and so now we're going to move into binomial distributions. So a binomial experiment has, oh, hold on, is a probability experiment that has four requirements. The first requirement is there's a fixed number of trials, so we're going to do this 10 times. We've got a fixed number of trials. It's not random. It's not like, oh, I think I want to ask you one more question. The second thing is your trials all have two outcomes. It's a success or it's a failure. There's no other option. The third requirement for binomial experiment or binomial um, distribution is the outcomes are independent, so one answer does not affect each other. So like if you said yes, then answer this question. That would be dependent, right? It's if. So they have to be independent. You just go down the line and you answer your fixed number of trials. And the probability of success remains the same for each trial. So, for example, binomial experiment, our classic flip a coin. How many outcomes are there? Two outcomes, right? It's either a heads or a tails. So, if I said flip a coin and get heads, our success would be heads, when, if we flip the coin and get heads. And what is the probability of flipping a coin and getting heads? 50% probability, right? One out of two. Or here's a, a good one that I always like to ask. Let's say I'm giving you a multiple choice test. Um, there's going to be 10 questions on it. And the answers are A, B, C, and D. Right? So, what would be a success on a multiple choice question? Success is when you get it right. Failure is when you get it wrong. It's like two options. You either got the answer or you didn't. There isn't any in between. So, success, success equals a correct answer. And in this particular case, what is the probability of a success? one out of four, right? One of those four answers is correct, so it would be a 25% probability of getting it right, or one out of four. Now, my recommendation is don't guess if you can eliminate answers. If you know one of them is wrong, now you're at a one out of three probability of success. If you can eliminate it down to two possibles, then you're at a 50% probability of success. In other words, teacher moment, study and know the, pro the um, questions, understand them, so then you are success rate is going to be high. So there would be a fixed number of trials, there'd be 10 questions. Um, your outcomes are either you got it right or you got it wrong. One outcome doesn't depend on another, they're independent, and the probability of success for every single one of those 10 questions is 25% because they're all A through D. So that is a binomial experiment. So a success is not necessarily good or bad. A success is just what your researcher is looking for. I'm looking for the number of people who said yes. I'm looking for the number of people who, or the number of times I flipped tails. I'm looking for the number of problems that you got right on that 10 question multiple choice quiz. So a multiple choice test is given, the outcomes are correct or incorrect. If the researcher is looking for the probability of incorrect answers, then an incorrect answer is considered a success, right? Because that's what I'm looking for. It's not a good or a bad. Don't be subjective about this. This is just what the researcher is looking for. I'm looking for incorrect. That would be my success. A failure then would be um, right answers or correct answers. All right, so there's that. So let's classify these as binomial or not. So two possible outcomes, right? If I roll a standard die 200 times, is that a binomial situation? 
Hopefully you're thinking, no, it is not, because you could get from one to six, right? You've got six possible outcomes every single one of those 200 times. So this is not a binomial distribution. If you survey 100 shoppers asking for their favorite shoe, is that a binomial distribution? Maybe they love Adidas. Maybe they love Nikes. Maybe they love Pumas or Skechers or something. There's more than two possible outcomes, so this is not a binomial situation. You survey 100 teenagers asking if they play the video game Halo. I don't know, is that, am I dating myself by using Halo? Fortnite, whatever, Mortal Kombat? If they play it, you, the answer would be yes or no, right? So that's a binomial situation. Because yes, they do, or no, they do not. If you ask 300 viewers if they recall seeing a Coca-Cola commercial during a particular show, is that a binomial situation? Yes, it is, right? Because they either saw it or they did not. Think about in math, I just had this thought, right? A binomial in math is two terms. A binomial in stats is two possible outcomes. If you test four brands of aspirin to see which brands are effective, is that a binomial situation? No, it's not, right? Because we're going to ask which brands are, are um, effective. It could be four possible answers. But if you just ask people if aspirin is effective to relieve their headache or whatever it might be, that's a yes or no question, right? So that one would be a binomial situation. All right, so a binomial distribution then are the outcomes of a binomial experiment and their probabilities. The outcomes of a binomial experiment and their probabilities. So we do the experiment. Remember, experiment doesn't mean you're flipping coins every time. It could be asking somebody about, um, you know, if aspirin or ibuprofen is good for headaches. Yes or no. So experiment is not just an experimental situation. It's collecting data. So let's get into some math here. So binomial distribution. So here's our notation. We got some formulas. So first of all, I hope that everybody knows what, that N, what N means, right? Way back at the beginning, it was the sample size. Now it's the number of trials, which is your sample size. It's how many times you did that experiment or how many pieces of data you collected. X is your number of successes. It's got to be a counting number, by the way. We're not looking at um, decimals, fractions, any of those kinds of things. The probability could be, but the number of successes, because we're counting. It's a counting number. P of S is the probability of success. This is like in words. P of F is the probability of failure. P is the actual, sorry about that, P is the actual numerical probability. So the probability of S is equal to P, small p. Q is the actual numerical probability of failure. You do need to know that. So, and we know probability adds up to 1. So if you know your probability of success is, say, 75%, then what's your probability of failure? That's got to be 25%, right? Because your P and Q have to equal 1. I'm going to just write that down over here just to make sure. Oh, whoa, I thought I was writing over there, and then it was way off. My board's a little off. So I'm going to say P plus Q equals 1. And then I'm going to try to move that. Oh, gosh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just delete that. Forget it. All right, okay, so in a binomial experiment, now that we know all of these symbols, here is the formula. The top formula is the technical formula. The top formula says, oh shoot, there it is. P of X is equal to um, N factorial over n minus x factorial times x factorial times p to the x power times q to the n minus x. Please make sure you stop so that you know that you've got that written down correctly. I was going to highlight it, but the board won't let me. 
but here's a better way to write it. A better way to write it is because, I hope I can circle this, because all of this business, oh my goodness, hold on one second. Sorry about that. I think I took care of business. So because all of this business right here is actually equal to a combination. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this combination. So in this second formula, this is the big one. This is the one that we're going to use a lot. P of X, so the probability of this many successes is equal to the combination you have n to choose from and you're choosing x times p to the x power so the probability of success to the x power times q to the n minus x power it looks a bit intimidating but it'll be okay once we put things in you're going to start to see a pattern and it will make sense so this is the probability of x successes We've got this many trials. So I say, oh, what's the probability that we're going to get five heads when I flip the coin ten times? So that's what we're going to calculate. I did put a little extra thing here. Keep in mind that you have to consider that you would get zero x's. That could happen, and we could still do that less than and all those other things. So our probability of rolling two twos. So a six sided die is tossed five times. A success is tossing a two. So I'm not just keeping track of how, what I roll. I want to know how many times I roll a two. A failure is tossing anything that is not a two. That's a failure. Each toss of the die is independent, right? One roll doesn't make a difference for any of the others. So P of S is rolling a two. Roll a two. Probability of failure, our failure is not a two. So what's our actual numerical probability of rolling a two? Right, so the probability of a two is equal to one over six. And our probability then of not a two is five out of six. So five sides that are not one side that is. So that means that our p of 2, our, p, our small p value is 1 sixth, our small q value is 5 sixths. We could go to decimals here, but they end up being repeating decimals. So that's a problem. So find the probability of getting exactly three twos. So what I'm saying is the probability of 3 is equal to. So now I'm going to set up my formula. So it's a n combination x, right? So how many trials do I have? Right here, I'm going to jot this down. n is equal to 5 trials. And my x is this, how many, 3 twos, the probability of that. So I'm going to do a combination 5 combination 3 times my probability of success, one-sixth, to the x power, so that would be to the third power, right? This is x right here. These two guys right here should always match, times my failure, probability of failure, five-sixths, to the n minus x power, so that would be five minus three power, so squared. These two exponents have to add up to your total number of trials. So go to your calculator. Calculate that out. You know where the combination button is. I know my problem started with decimals, but I'm going to, or sorry, with fractions. I'm going to finish these with decimals. When I do my five combination three multiplied by a six to the third and a fifth to the, or five six to the second power, I ended up with about a 0.032. I think that's right. Double check me. I forgot that I put my formula down here if that helps you to see it. 
So let's just talk about um, number letter B. Let's skip C. Let's talk about B. So find the probability of getting exactly zero twos. So we still know that our number of trials is five, right? And this time I want to know the probability of how many successes? Exactly zero, right? So zero is my x in this particular case. So I'm going to do probability of zero is equal to n combination, n combination x. So five combination zero times my probability of success, one six to the x power. Remember, those guys should match. You use the same subscript and then your next times 5, 6 to the n minus x power. That would be a 5 because I know that these two guys right here have to add up to my n number of trials. So go to your calculator, hit pause here. Make sure that you end up with the same answer that, as I do. If not, we need to talk about something in the meantime. And I ended up with a probability of getting zero twos is about a 0 0.402, which means about a 40% probability of getting no twos in five rolls. I mean, that's somewhat likely, right? Part A, we found the probability of getting three twos is about 3% likelihood. Not very likely. Could happen but not very likely. Think about playing Yahtzee, right? You do sometimes get Yahtzee all in one roll. It could happen, but it's not very likely. All right, so now that we've got that, let's talk about another quick example here. Let's see, probability of too much concern. In a survey, three out of four students said that the courts show too much concern for criminals. Listen, I didn't make up the question. Find the probability that three out of seven randomly selected students will agree with this statement. So let's figure out what we've got here. So we're going to need to know n, right? We're going to need to know x, we're going to need to know p, and we're going to need to know q. So what is my n? What's my number of trials? What's the number of students that are going to be asked? Seven, right? Seven randomly selected students, so there's my n. And then it says the probability that three out of those, so that's my x. My p is my probability of success, so agree with this statement. So how many people agree with this statement? Well, it says in that first sentence, three out of four students say that that is the case. So three out of four, or if you prefer, a 0.75. So if my probability of success is 0.75, what's my probability of failure or students who do not agree with that statement would be 25%, right, or one-fourth. So then I could do this problem. So my probability of three students agreeing with that, I don't care that it's three out of seven because I use that seven in the rest of my problem. So it's going to be a combination with n and x, so 7 combination 3 times my probability of success, so 0.75 to the power of 3, right? So always those two matching. And then my probability of failure, 0.25, and that's going to be to what power? Should be a 4, right? Because my 3 plus 4, my two exponents have to add up to n. Do that one in your calculator, avoided some fractions this time. So the probability that three out of seven randomly selected students will agree that the courts show too much concern for criminals comes out to about a, what is that, a 0 .058, I believe. So about 5.8% uh, probability that you'd pick three. It's a little bit low because the probability of success is 75%. Well, three out of seven is less than half, right? So it does make sense that it would be a lower probability. If I had asked you about four or five randomly selected students, it probably would be a higher probability. All right, so let's head on over here and talk about mean variance and standard deviation. We know how to find these things, but it's a little bit different in a binomial distribution. 
So mean is really easy. Everybody me remembers mu, right? Mu is equal to n times p. n is our number of trials, our sample size if you prefer. P is the probability of success. I hope you've got all these letters. Remember back at the beginning of the year when you had like a um, formula sheet and a symbol sheet? I'm not sure if you're still adding to that or if you might want to resume adding to that. Now that we're done with um, probability, chapter four, we're back into a lot of these symbols. So mu is population mean, n is sample size or number of trials, and p is probability of success. Variance is, right, sig we know that symbol is sigma. Sigma squared is equal to n times p times 1 minus p. I actually like to, instead of 1 minus p, we know that that's equal to q. So I like to say variance is equal to n times p times q. That's easy peasy. And then we know how to get from standard deviation if you already know variance. Everybody knows that standard deviation is the square root of variance. So the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, or I like to say the square root of n times p times q. So let's do a quick example. I think we should be good. This is not difficult. It's just a lot of stuff to keep track of. This is a lot simpler, right, than just our probability distributions, shorter formulas. So, for a binomial distribution for which there are 500 trials, the probability of success is 0.25. What's the mean variance in standard deviation? So, we know that n is 500. We know that p is 0.25. We could probably know what q is, right? Because p plus q have to add up to 1. So, we've got ourselves, our n's, our p's, and our q's. That's everything we need to know. So mu is equal to n times p, 500 times a 0.25, which I believe that's going to be 125. Check my math. Variance is going to be equal to n times p. I'll put n times p over here. I'll put n times p times q. Oops. Try that one more time. So I've got a 500 times my 0.25, which is P, times my 0.75, which is Q. When I calculate that out, I believe that's a 93.75. And last but not least, oh, that was supposed to be sigma squared. I forgot. That was variance, right? So this one's variance. So, for this one, our standard deviation, then, is the square root of our variance. Perhaps you've already got that 93.75 in your calculator, and you're just going to square root it. That comes out to approximately 9.682. There's our mean, our variance, and our standard deviation. So if we were going to do this problem, I probably need to change it. 32% of adult internet users have purchased products or services online. I feel like it's a lot higher, especially after COVID. For a random sample of 200 adult internet users, find the mean and standard deviation for the number who have purchased goods or services. All I want to do is ask you about N, P, and Q, and I don't think we need to do this problem because I'm hoping you've got these figured out. So what is my N? What's my number of trials or my sample size, right? Right here, 200. My P, my probability of success. Notice down here in the question it says the number who have purchases, purchased goods or services online. That's my success, which means 32% have. So 0.32. And then, of course, you're going to do a quick math problem, and you're going to tell me what Q is. I believe, is that a 0.68 when I do the math? Remember, P plus Q have to add up to 1. You can do the math from there. Mu is equal to N times P. Variance is equal to N times P times Q. And standard deviation is the square root of variance. That's it for Section 5.3. Have a good one. I will talk to you next time.